In the 1930s and 40s, writer, folklorist, and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston was a celebrated figure of the Harlem Renaissance. Hurston is best remembered for her 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, the story of Janie Crawford and her attempts at self-realization. Hurston's other novels include Jonah's Gourd Vine, the story of an unfaithful man with an understanding wife, Moses, Man of the Mountain, a retelling of the biblical story of Moses, and Seraph on the Swanee, Hurston's only book that features white people as main characters. As an anthropologist who studied under the renowned Franz Boas, Hurston published two collections of folklore, Mules and Men and Tell My Horse. Hurston also wrote dozens of short stories, essays, and dramatic works. In 1948, Hurston's reputation and career were destroyed by false accusations that almost drove her to suicide. By the time Hurston died in 1960, she was broke, forgotten, and her books were out of print. Today, Zora Neale Hurston is again recognized as an important 20th century writer. Her work is taught in high school and college classes around the world, and two annual festivals celebrate her achievements. Until now, though, literary critics and biographers have largely overlooked the last decade of Hurston's life. During the lost years of Zora Neale Hurston, she returned to the place she called home, Florida. Zora Neale Hurston grew up in Eatonville, Florida, the oldest incorporated town entirely governed by African Americans. Because she grew up in Eatonville, an all-black community, where there was not artificial um, lens of, of viewing people, as she says in, in Mules and Men, uh, you got, in Eatonville you got what your, what your strengths brought you. Uh, if you were an energetic, uh, aggressive, um, productive person, then that's who you were. Uh, if you were a lazy, no-count, uh, ne'er-do-well, that's who you were, and you couldn't use as an excuse what they or the outside society uh, did to you or against you. Zora Neale Hurston's literary career began even before she graduated from Barnard College in 1927. In 1925, Hurston's short story Spunk was included in a respected anthology called The New Negro. While attending college in New York, Hurston worked with Harlem Renaissance contemporaries including Langston Hughes and Wallace Thurman on the literary magazine Fire. After earning her Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology, Hurston continued her graduate studies at Columbia University. In 1929, Hurston moved to the quiet town of O'Galley in Brevard County, Florida to write her first and most important collection of African-American folklore. Zora came to O'Galley in um, April of 1929, and she, her goal was to find a little place where she could, she could write and she could have peace and quiet. Um, she found that in a one-room cottage here in O'Galley, um, and she rented it. She had a, a pretty good rental agreement, and she used that time to fish in the Indian River and to enjoy nature, and she put together her folklore stories in a book which was published called Mules and Men. The book Mules and Men was published in 1935 and was essentially a nonfiction account of Hurston's adventures and experiences as a folklorist an anthropologist in the late 1920s and early 1930s. It's divided into two sections. The first section is devoted to her experiences in Eatonville collecting folklore and includes 70 of her glorious folktales, including why women always take advantage of men. The second section covers the period that she uh, did research in New Orleans into hoodoo religion and practices, and even became a priestess. And the book is important not just from the standpoint of its entertainment value, but it was the first book of folklore that recorded the tales exactly as they were spoken. And today it is still considered the preeminent collection of African American folklore. During the lost years of Zora Neale Hurston in the 1950s, she would return to the same cottage in O'Galley where she had been so productive and happy in 1929. First, though, Hurston would write her best-known and much-loved work, the novel Their Eyes Were Watching God. My personal favorite work of Hurston's is, by far, Their Eyes Are Watching God. It's a, no it's a beautiful novel. It's a love story. 
about a woman who not only finds her true love, but she finds her own inner strength and her voice. And it just doesn't get any better than that. Their eyes were watching God. It's just, it's an, it's history, it's fiction, it's pathos, it's, it's tragedy, all rolled up together in one incredible literary gem. Zora Neale Hurston is a part of my family lore. I did not really understand who she was in the literary uh, realm until I was uh, older. I was actually I actually read The Eyes of Watching God when my after our first son was born. Uh, that that book was a Penguin classic that cost ninety nine cents. And when I was trying to uh, while my son was napping. I would, that's how I, that's how I read that book. I, I know Zora Neale Hurston from my, my mother's mother uh, telling us about her, her uh, companionship with Zora Neale Hurston, sometimes uh, scaring me uh, with uh, uh, folk tales from Zora Neale Hurston. The success of Their Eyes Were Watching God in 1937 made Zora Neale Hurston a famous writer. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, Hurston was the only well-known published author working under the auspices of the Works Progress Administration. The WPA Federal Writers Project was established by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to provide jobs for unemployed writers during the Great Depression. Stetson Kennedy was head of the Florida Writers Project Unit on Folklore, Oral History, and Socio-Ethnic Studies. In 1942, he published an important social history of Florida called Palmetto Country. Stetson Kennedy was Zora Neale Hurston's supervisor when she worked for the WPA. Well, it was the, the Great Depression for one thing, and I didn't have a job along with tens of millions of other Americans. And uh, at the same time, President Roosevelt had organized something called the Federal Writers Project. And I thought this would be an opportunity for a 21-year-old uh, to start a writing career, so I signed up for the Florida Writers Project. In a short time, they did uh, elevate me to that position. I was wearing three hats. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, as a matter of fact, was uh, my, I was her boss. She was not an easy one to boss, I can tell you. She fortunately worked out of her home in Eatonville, and I was in Jacksonville, so it was like that. Sora Neal Hurston frequently had problems with authority figures, and she did not see eye to eye with her supervisor Stetson Kennedy. Politically, Hurston was a libertarian conservative, while Kennedy was a radical progressive. Hurston believed that African Americans should help themselves, while Kennedy thought it was important to fight social inequities between blacks and whites. Despite their philosophical differences, Stetson Kennedy admired Hurston's work as a folklorist and anthropologist. The first thing I think of is a little story she sent in. She said one day God was on his way to Palatka, and him and St. Peter was hoofing it. And it went on from there. <laughs> so everything she sent in was a, a real jewel. Uh, Alan Lomax was also a good friend of mine, colleague, and he said that in the field, Zora was absolutely magnificent. He was recording in Eatonville with Zora and as early as 35. And he went on out the other day. And, this is Georgia C. Allen. Yeah, Zora was, was a mess. <laughs> uh, our politics uh, were very different. Uh, uh, she never turned in any black po protest law, for example. And, of course, that was one of the very few forms that the blacks could protest. If it didn't rhyme and you didn't dance a jig a while, you were dead. Uh, but Zora chose to ignore all that stuff. And, so I made it one of my special things. Stetson Kennedy was so dedicated to fighting for racial equality that after World War II, he infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan and exposed their secrets in his book, The Klan Unmasked. Growing up in the independent African-American town of Eatonville instilled in Zora Neale Hurston a confidence that gave her a unique perspective on race. Her views on race relations in the United States often put her at odds with her Harlem Renaissance contemporaries. For example, during the lost years of the 1950s, Hurston wrote an editorial in the Orlando Sentinel arguing against the landmark Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Board of Education. Hurston was never a segregationist. She vehemently wanted desegregation in American society. What she opposed was 
the legislation of it. She didn't believe that the Supreme Court should force two cultures that had been segregated for centuries to suddenly mix, and particularly at a time when there had been violence and conflict over a recent Supreme Court decision that made white primaries unconstitutional. She saw the violence and was concerned about you know, having further violence as a result of being forced to do something that she knew white people did not want to do. And she was also concerned about the cultural aspect of it. She believed that if the black children went to white schools, that some of their cultural values would be lost. She felt with, um, with regard to desegregation that it was an insult for white congresspeople and the government to say that black children could not be educated without being in schools with white children. That, to her, negated all of the efforts that black educators had made over the years and black families to, to acquire an education. She thought separate but equal was a goal to be, to be, uh, to be um, strived for, that, she, that, that black children could receive quality education if they were given the resources, and that integrating schools was going to disenfranchise and render powerless so many black educators that were so gifted and had done so much for, for black children. The corpus of her work is about black life. It's just that she chose to uh, speak and write about what she would say the ordinary. Um, when I compiled and edited Zora, Zora Neale Hurston, The Woman in Her Community, she writes um, to a graduate student at FAMU, and she says, I choose to see Negroes as normal. And I think that that really does inform. Some, sometimes there is, um, oftentimes, there is a, a tendency to look at black America through as a pathology. And I think that that's really, you know, Zora Neale Hurston wasn't going to have anything to do with that. Uh, she was not going to whitewash, uh, no pun intended, um, black life. She addresses uh, the, the um, color consciousness that exists within the black community. It's just that she handles it within the context of uh, broader, uh, broader, broader themes because you, it's, it would be inappropriate. We couldn't even make the case that Zora Neale Hurston was trying to run away from the black experience. The black experience is a totality of what she looks, what she uh, concerns herself with. It's just the perspective that she brings to it. She was falsely accused of molestation of a, a young boy. Um, falsely accused, completely uh, vindicated, because she was not in the United States when the alleged abuse occurred or, or crime occurred. But the black press... Um, picked up the story after she was vindicated and uh, really ruined her reputation. Uh, I think that she f uh, fled back to her home state. After leaving New York, Hurston lived briefly in Miami and Belle Glade, Florida, before returning to O'Galley. She moved into the same cottage where she had been so productive and happy at the beginning of her career. It is this final decade of Zora Neale Hurston's life in the 1950s that has been largely overlooked by literary critics and biographers until now. Hurston's O'Galley Cottage was in an African-American section of town in 1929, but by 1951 it was in a white neighborhood. Even in segregated Florida, Hurston was able to move back into the home. The owner of the cottage, William Gleason, uh, had a lot of respect and admiration for Hurston, and because his grandfather was the founder and developer of Ugali, you know, his opinion of Hurston had a lot of weight. But I think more importantly, it was Hurston's personality 
uh, that finally won her neighbors over. When she first moved into the property, it had been dilapidated. Uh, no one had lived in there for quite a while. And she painted it a bright yellow. She cleaned up the trash from the yard and planted flowers. And before two months was over, the place was a show place. It actually stopped traffic. She had turned the yard into this beautiful garden with a park-like sweep. And her neighbors appreciated her effort. Galley, Florida, July 9, 1951. Dear Jean, thanks for the money. I'm fixing up my new home here. It's a one-room house, but a large room, and set in two blocks of ground with an artisan well. I have to do some pioneering, but I find that I like it. I am the happiest I have been in the last ten years, irregardless of whether Scribner's like the novel or not. I'm up every morning at five o'clock chopping down weeds and planting flowers and things. That is why I've been so long getting to my machine to write letters, I go to bed happily tired and swear that I will write you a letter first thing in the morning. But the birds which I feed and who have begun to collect their already in large numbers wake me up clamoring for their breakfast, and I dash out and play stale bread, etc., and watch the many colors and many behaviors of my feathered friends. Somehow, this one spot on earth feels like home to me. I have always intended to come back here. That is why I'm doing so much to make a go of it. My best to you and yours, and pray that we make a lot of money this year so that when and if I'm told that I can buy this place, I can do it and build a comfortable little new house on it. Love and faithful feelings, Zora. While living in O'Galley, Hurston kept in touch with friends, including historian and literary agent Jean Parker Waterbury, Mary Holland, wife of State Senator Spessard Holland, and fellow Florida writer Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Zora particularly admired the way that Marjorie um, characterized African Americans in her um, in her work in The Yearling and in uh, Cross Creek, which came out in 1942. Um, she thought that Marjorie. Rawlings was spot on in her characterizations of of blacks, um, local blacks, rural blacks, working class people um, in her community. So that won Zora's admi um, admiration. And of course, Marjorie became a fan of, of Zora for the same reasons, for her wonderful characterizations and um, the way that she, uh, that she wrote about Floridians. So they had a lot in common. Galley, Florida, June 13, 1955. Dear, dear, dear Miss Mary, you will never know how happy the arrival of your delayed letter made me. My soul was reaching out to you. I was so depressed by the death of Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, first because I am deprived of the warmth of the association, and secondly because I feel that I failed her in her last extremity. I wrote her that I would be there as soon as I could, that everything went bad for me at that time. My car, like the old one-horse shade, just fell to pieces. And there I was, with no transportation and no means to replace it. And I could not bear to admit it to her, lest she feel sorry for me. Next thing I knew was the announcement of her death. I came here to a galley a quiet little spot to sit down and do a work that I had had in contemplation for some years, a life of Herod the Great. Well, Hurston, after 10 years of researching Herod's life, uh, considered him a glittering personality in one of the most luminous periods of ancient history. He was an able administrator. He was a brave soldier who protected Judea and Rome from its enemies. He uh, was responsible for incredible architectural achievements. He built cities, he built the Great Temple, as well as the resplendent port of Sisera. And there was no evidence, although it is taken as truth even today, that Herod or anyone else uh, planned the slaughter of male children in order to try and snag Jesus in the net. Hurston felt that folklore had replaced truth. And so she wanted to present the factual Herod, 
rather than the folklore Herod. And it became a, a glorious passion, is what she called it, of hers until the end of her life. The 1954 murder trial of Ruby McCollum provided Hurston the opportunity to write a series of articles for the Pittsburgh Courier and contribute to the book Woman in the Sewanee County Jail by William Bradford Huey. Ruby McCollum's husband ran a very popular gambling operation in Live Oak, Florida. Ruby was an African-American woman accused of killing a prominent white physician. She pulled no punches. Um, she was sympathetic to the defendant, even though the defendant... Um, did indeed murder this physician and, you know, claimed to. There were mitigating circumstances as far as Zora was concerned. There was evidence that was suppressed that Zora made sure to um, write about in her work. Um, there was a testimony of people that were silenced because they were, their testimony would explain the circumstances behind the murder and what was going on in Live Oak during that period. The, um, the sheriff did everything he could to um, make sure that justice was not carried through in that particular um, event, uh, that, uh, that particular trial. And Zora did everything she could to make sure that all of the dirty laundry of Live Oak was aired thoroughly in um, in a national and a national level newspaper. When Hurston was unable to purchase her cottage in O'Galley, she moved to an apartment in Coco and then to a trailer on Merritt Island. During this period, she worked as a librarian. Hurston was fired from Patrick Air Force Base as a technical librarian, basically because she supported a whistleblower um, colleague who had turned in one of the supervisors for destroying documents without going through the proper authorization. So she collected unemployment for a while and finally was offered a job by a man named C.E. Bolin, who had founded a newspaper in Fort Pierce called the Fort Pierce Chronicle. So she moved very soon afterward and went to Fort Pierce to take the job in 1957. Zora Neale Hurston died in January 1960 in the St. Lucie County Welfare Home. She was broke, forgotten, and her books were out of print. She was a ward of the, of, the, of the county, and when she died, her effects thus were ordered burned. They were ordered destroyed. Um, nobody had come forward to claim them. Um, a friend of hers, who was a sheriff's deputy, was going by the nursing home at the time and stopped and literally doused the flames and uh, saved a bunch of her um, manuscripts that were uh, about to be um, destroyed. Today, Zora Neale Hurston is more popular than ever. Annual festivals in Eatonville and Fort Pierce celebrate her legacy. Hurston's work is taught in high schools and colleges around the world. And I, the International Baccalaureate uh, teacher, of 11th grade students in Hampton, Virginia, is planning to uh, bring her students to Eatonville for a field trip. And as we were talking about the planning and the budget, I said, well, will they be uh, doing Disney or Universal? She said, no, <laughs> we're coming to Eatonville. And that's the only reason that we're coming to Florida is to coming to Eatonville. And after we do this uh, day, then we will be returning. So it's a uh, quite interesting to see that now, if you're going to be educated, you have to have read Zora Neale Hurston. 